It was a very magical time. Like to the point of neglecting, you know, neglecting my love life. Do you know what I mean? Like I would, (laughs) everybody else was standing around in the bar trying to pick up. I wasn't completely, I don't know, I just wasn't interested or something. I was more interested in hanging out with the drag queens downstairs. And yet, what's so interesting, I never did drag. I was never interested in doing drag. I am Kay Anderson, and you are listening to Lost Spaces, a podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories they created there, and the people that they used to know. Bob Down is the stage name of comedian Mark Trevora, who is if I could be so bold as to say, a bloody legend. Getting his start in the Globos, a 60s throwback band in the early 80s, his life was turned upside down when the band broke, and in amongst the changes was a move from Melbourne to Sydney. In Sydney, he discovered the legendary Albury Hotel, which is one of two queer venues that were used as the inspiration for the film Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. We caught up to find out about that time in his life, the basement full of drag costumes and being the dag of dags, whatever that means. It was Sydney in 1982. I cannot even begin to tell you how amazing Sydney was from the late 70s right through, even after the virus hit. Even with that, it was still absolutely amazing. It was one of the greatest gay towns in the world that's ever existed. There was, it was just, it just was going off. Oxford Street, which is our gay district, was there were just dozens of bars and clubs and it was jumping seven nights a week. I used to go out seven nights a week. <laughs> if, I, if I wasn't working, I would go out. The only, I, I once worked out that I honestly think that I went out every night from when I was about 18. That was when I first hit the scene in Melbourne. I went out, I think I went out every single night unless I was sick from the age of about 18 or 19 till about 35. <gasps> wow. I know. That's a lot of different outfits. <laughs> oh, no, I was the dag of dags. I think I just always wore the same thing, always, <laughs> you know, jeans and a jeans and a t-shirt. No, no, no. I'm 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 not particularly sartorial when I'm not being bob, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I think it's because of the costumes, because it's a, a, such a high-style costumed act. I think my in my personal life I deliberately dress as simply and dress down as I, because I just can't be bothered. <laughs> and so, so can we just talk quickly about the Globos then? So what, when they hit and uh, because it was the beginning of the eighties, what was like the pressure on you to be non-sexual or to just be in the closet? Yes, it was. Um, I was very closety when I was in the Globos. Yeah, I was. Yeah, now that I look back on it, not in my private life, but certainly it was at a, it was an era. Even this is even before AIDS hit. There, it was an era where uh, it wasn't. Um, it just it was w- the, the the prevailing attitude in the business was that it just you could do what you liked in private, and everybody, of course, everybody was bloody gay mm-hmm. or lesbian. You could do what you wanted in private, and you could live a completely gay uh, life out, gay life. But it was just not considered a good idea to uh, talk about it or to let it be known in terms of your, your, of your professional performing. And that was the prevailing attitude among actors, among uh, pop stars, everybody. Everybody was in the closet as far as uh, being public about it. Mm. And then, of course, AIDS hit in 1983, 84, and then it became even 10 times worse. You had to you had to absolutely keep all that stuff, you know, very separated. There was a lot of 
real compartmentalization that went on in your private life and your public life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Although I must admit, when we hosted Countdown, which was our top of the pops, in uh, we hosted Countdown in August or September, nineteen eighty-two, and we were we were co-hosting it. And, and right at the end, as we were saying good night, I yelled out "Good night, Ludwig" to my boyfriend at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so that was an early, you know, an early straining to break free of the leash. I think I was. Yeah. I must have been. So, yeah. And as it turned out, he wasn't watching. <laughs> no, he was out on the rat. Oh, man. Isn't that hilarious? <laughs> My boyfriend, who I was living with in Sydney, because, of course, I, the first thing I did was run, and, and, and you know, he, there was no answer at home. And then finally, when I got on to I said, did you see me say goodnight? And he was very sheepish and had to admit that he'd been, <laughs> that he'd been out on the rat <laughs> and hadn't stayed home to watch Countdown because we were in Melbourne. We'd filmed it in Melbourne. Oh, I didn't Isn't that know, hilarious? Didn't I've just it. remembered that. Oh, man. I've just remembered that. Oh, it didn't last much longer than that, naturally. <laughs> we staggered on for another few months. We, we're, we're still friends, but we were never, never meant to. We should never have been boyfriends. We should never have been living together. <laughs> but you don't know when you're 23, do you? I mean, for heaven's sake. Oh, no, no, of course not. I mean, you don't know when you're 43. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, ever, yeah, ever. Yeah, <laughs> Um, Sometimes you don't know when you're 61, I can yeah. tell you. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so yes, there was that was the prevailing attitude. It was not a good idea to be out, especially if you were an actor, but or or, or in any of the creative arts. But the great thing about being a cabaret performer, uh, and then later, you know, not long after that, becoming a comedian, a gay comedian, it, it was sort of like. Um, you were sort of much, you were freer than if you were in a pop or rock band or if you were uh, a, an actor. Yeah, so I was very lucky. The the, what I, the field that I was in, we were generating our own work and we made our own work. So it did, it very quickly became uh, something that I incorporated, yeah, well, obviously, in, into Bob Down. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I was going to say, like, as a cabaret act... Uh, it's pretty hard to then be like, oh, no, I'm straight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it was all very, and it was all very sort of, it was a very natural progression. I don't remember making much, <coughs> making much of a decision about that, that Bob was going to be, a, a, you know, a very gay, a very gay act. It was just my, he was my character that made people laugh. And I suppose it was, it, it was just intrinsically camp. Yeah, so it wasn't it wasn't like oh I'm going to fly the flag. I never sort of thought about it like that. It was just the way it was. It was just what it was that I did. How I made people laugh. Yeah, um, and so let's get back onto Sydney. You were talking about Sydney being um, yeah. a magical place. The thing time. that was going on in Sydney. Well, the thing that was going on in Sydney from the late seventies, the mid late seventies through till oh you know the end of the nineties really, up until the Olympics. It, it was um, it was a very corrupt town. It was a very wild town. It was a bit like a mini version of what New York was like at that time as well. The difference between Sydney and New York, though, was that Sydney was very uh, it was a very um, wealthy. It was a very you know comfortable middle you know very much mm. more. Uh, it, whereas New York had gone through that thing of bankruptcy and. It, New York was very run down and, and was but it was wild. What was going on in New York? in nightlife and in bohemian life was really wild. And Sydney had the same thing, even though it was a much more cosmopolitan, a much more comfortable town to live in. Um, there was a huge bohemian underground gay life that had it exploded and, and, it, and it went right back too. It had been really a big gay town since the 50s and 60s and even before that. But particularly in the late 50s and 60s through the 70s, uh, Sydney had uh, one of the biggest and most active gay communities I- in the world. And so by 1982, it was just absolutely swinging. It was wild. And then on top of that, the, p- the cops were so corrupt that, that there were no real, there were no licensing laws that it's anybody seemed to adhere to. Everything went all night. Oh, wow. We used to, we used to go on stage at Kinsella's 
on Fridays and Saturday nights, we used to go on at 2.30. So we did, we never left Kinsella's until, until the sun was coming up, about 4 or 5, and then we would go and have breakfast at, at all-night cafes in, in King's Cross. Mm. So the sun would come up while we were having, a, having breakfast and listening to music on the jukebox. <laughs> So, so it was it was really fantastically uh, over the top wild. It was it was ve- it was like a party every night on Oxford Street. It was quite festive. It was incredible, and that was you know outside of Mardi Gras and Sleaze Ball and all of these big parties. Because of course, then what happened in the mid eighties was that Sydney was one of the leading places in the world that started with the giant warehouse parties. You know, the giant um, yeah. parties in huge uh, concert halls and and um, ballrooms and stuff with thousands of people. At one point in the mid-'80s, there was one of those parties at the Horton Pavilion, which is a 7,000-capacity uh, you know, uh, venue. There was one every weekend. There was a dance party every weekend in 1985 and eighty six. Wow. It was insane. <laughs> and, of course, you, coming, from, coming from Melbourne, which was, you know, Melbourne had quite a vibrant little gay scene and, and has a big, very vibrant gay community now but it had a very small but very vibrant and active gay community back then as well but it was nothing compared to sydney sydney was had that sort of mecca mm. quality about it it was like san francisco or new york or london you know it was the place you dreamed of going to mm. and so the, the fact that we had this big success in sydney meant just everything to us it was it was, and it's, to happen when you're 23 years old was so exciting yeah. It was incredible. Yeah. It's all on YouTube. You can look it up on YouTube. Just type the Globos, G-L-O-B-O-S. <laughs> I've, I've, plug, I've, plug. I've uploaded a lot of live footage from those shows that we did there. Hmm. It was a lip sync act. We lip synced everything, old records and old TV commercials, and, cl- and then lip synced our own sketches and lip synced our own records. It was bizarre. Why, why did you lip sync your own things? I know, because it was a lip sync act, because it was recreating all the pop shows in Australia in the 60s, in the early, mid-60s. All the local pop shows were young kids just lip syncing records, overseas hits, Uh hits by people from overseas, Uh because there were no film clips. You couldn't get film clips of Scylla singing You're My World or... There were no videos, and so to so to create because they weren't in none of those those acts came to Australia very rarely. Mm. Whereas in London and New York, they're all living there, so they're all going to be on pop top of the pops. But in Australia, there was nothing else to do but just get up and get a bunch of kids and lip sync uh, hit records. And so we were recreating those lip sync TV shows. Ah, okay. Yeah. And then there was the drag element too, you see, because I'd already fallen completely fallen in love with drag performance. But what the Globos was that was wasn't it was drag, but the boys were boys and the girls were girls, and we were all and it was very elegant and high style, exactly recreating the hairdos and dresses and suits and shoes. It was really accurate, yeah. um, sort of reviving an early sixties look. It was very obsessively accurate. It wasn't it wasn't uh, exaggerated like drag. <laughs> and they look it's really weird because the clips now are like 30 years what getting on to 40 years old and and they look it looks what we did looks like old television <laughs> you know what i mean it's actually quite strange it looks like it's from the actual era that you were yeah it looks like, <laughs> and it wasn't that wasn't that long after the era that we were recreating it it, turns out. it's that hilarious. it was only 10 or 15 years in but it felt like ancient history because pop culture moved so fast from the 50s through to the 90s that five years now, you know, if you hear a record from five years ago, it still sounds like records sound like now. Yeah, yeah. Whereas then, five years was was a lifetime, and 10 or 15 or 20 years was like 50 years. So everything moved very fast. It was a very exciting time to be young, I've got to say. Oh, see, I thought that was just because I was getting old that everything sounds like it could have just been released whenever... Yeah, no, no, exactly. The the mu- music of the last twenty years is just to me. I'm so not interested in it, and I sound so ignorant. And there's and there, and of course there's fabulous music of, in any era, but but I just love that. I just you know I grew up with teenage cousins living around the corner in Melbourne, and that they had they were pop tragics, and they had all the Beatles, they had all the hot records, all singles and albums, 
and I'd be there listening to Sergeant Pepper all the way through at the age of ten. You know, yeah. yeah. So I was, I, yeah. So I was deeply influenced by all that. Um. Okay. So shall we talk about the Albury Hotel? We shall talk about <laughs> the Albury Hotel because the in 1982 and 83 and 84 the Albury Hotel was totally where it's at. It was the number one gay pub in Australia. And also there was another pub called the Imperial that was out in um, Enmore in the inner west. But on Oxford Street, um, the clubs that ruled on Oxford Street was the, was the Albury and then the Midnight Shift was the nightclub that we all went to after the Albury closed. Uh. So the Albury used to shut. Uh, pubs used to shut quite early. Pubs used to shut at about... I think it was about 1 a.m., but then, then there were nightclubs that went just basically all night. Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, so you'd go down and we didn't used to sort of leave the house and we didn't used to have dinner. I remember not, we, we didn't used to leave the house till about 10. People didn't have dinner till about 10 or 11. Oh, very European. <laughs> Yeah, it was. <laughs> and, of course, the weather in Sydney is so fabulous, especially in summer. We get months of summer. Yeah. Like, our summer goes for about five or six months, like warm. But it's still, you know, we're in mid-late autumn now or mid-autumn now, and it's still warm enough. I, I'm in shorts and a T-shirt. Mm. You know, it's um, it, we have the most fabulous weather, and so it really lends itself to going out. We have very lovely um mild evenings it's very rare it's only two or three months of the year that we actually would say that it was cold you mm-hmm. know what i mean mm-hmm. but we, it's so so sydney uh, back then everybody went out just everybody just went out and so uh, the albury was um the albury did he, the albury did drag had different drag shows seven nights a week they, they had a whole bunch of artists different artists that that owned different nights do you know what i mean but i had my favorite I had my favourite night, nights because my favourite group was a group called the Showbags, which was a trio of, of lip sync drag queens, a bit like the a bit very sort of quite in, in, a, in a Sydney in a Sydney aesthetic, very similar to what Lily Savage was doing in the Disappointer Sisters. That, mm-hmm. that he he was the part of that trio at the uh, at the Vauxhall Tavern at, around the same time. Mm-hmm. After we became friends years later, we worked out that we were doing. We, I was going to to see drag that was very similar to what he was doing at the Vauxhall Tavern in the early 80s, mm. late 70s and early 80s. So the group that I was obsessed with was the Showbags, and that was Cindy Pastel, who Priscilla is based on. He, Cindy Pastel is the is the queen that has the son who's now, he's just turned 37. Oh, okay. Cindy's son has just turned 37. So, so um, Cindy was the main inspiration for, for the Hugo Weaving character. And, and Stefan Elliott used to hang around at, at, the, at the the two pubs that Stefan Elliott used to go to, and he recreates in in the film are the Albury and the Imperial over in um, in Enmore, which was another huge gay nightclub and pub with with nightly drag. So there was a huge amount of drag going on all up and down the strip. There was a there was a cabaret club called the Capriccios that had been pumping since the early 70s doing two different shows a night with people sitting down and eating you know chips in a basket chicken and chips in a basket <laughs> so there was and that these shows were elaborately beautiful there's one show at Capriccios which is on YouTube and it's the whole thing and it's absolutely incredible it's an incredible video because they took the the gels out so you can see the color of the costumes were incredible so there was a, a lot of drag. And then there was Lay Girls, which was drag for straight audiences in King's Cross. Mm. So so there was it was enormous amount of drag going on, mm. enormous amount of drag. And the Albury was great because the Albury, they just used to um, perform. But there was a, it was an Art Deco bar that had a, just a big rectangle-shaped bar with a curved, long curved, sort of island bar and, and with a gap between in the middle in front of the DJ booth. And that's where they used to perform the shows. They, they just performed the shows behind the bar with everybody around almost sort of like theatre in the round. Uh-huh. And, and, and they would get up on the bar and, and sashay. They would use the bar, this huge rectangular bar with curved ends, Art Deco kind of curved ends. They would use it as a runway. Oh, wow. And the, and the, 
the barman, it was all like a choreographed dance. The barman knew to get out of the way because Cindy was, was charging along, you know, and there was a follow spot that, that filmed, you know, that it was really, the shows were really elaborate with multiple costume changes. They'd, so that there was a sort of a little mini office behind the bar that they would do their quick changes in. <laughs> it was quite, it was, it was really uh, magnificent. And they would do spot shows. So they would do a series of um, solos and then they would do a production show like, like spread out over, you know, two or three hours. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the place was, it didn't matter what night of the week it was, that it was packed and spilling out onto the street where everybody used to drink on the street, uh, which the, the cops, again, because the cops were so corrupt, they were being paid off. The cops allowed people to sort of drink and smoke on the street, crowded around the bar because it was so hot, because it was so crowded. You know, on any one night the, at the Aubrey Hotel, there was, it was in the top 10 pubs in Sydney uh, in terms of what it, um, the money that it generated over the bar. Um, it was a license to bring money. There would have been, honestly, I, there, there would have been on a night that it was really packed, there'd be five, 600 people there. Wow. It was absolutely, yeah, it was incredible. Wow. You couldn't move. You, you had to fight your way to the front. <laughs> and so do you, do you remember the first time you ever went? Uh, you know, it's really strange. I'm, I've got the, so I've got a weird, I've got a really good memory for certain things and a terrible memory for other things. And one of my, one of the things that I'm really bad at is I'm often very bad at remembering the first time I've met people or gone somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have the Aubrey, I believe, opened in about 1980. So I, I would have been, I would have been taken there when we were. I would have been taken there when we started. See, we were going back and forward from Melbourne in those first few months in late '82, when we were doing the seasons at Kinsella. So it would have been, I would probably not have gone to the Aubrey until early '83, when I actually moved up to Sydney. Mm-hmm. That's when I would have started really going to the Aubrey a lot. Yeah. But I remember just I, re- I remember just the, the scale the size compared to Melbourne it was just it was th- you know two or three times bigger than any of the Melbourne bars or clubs and it, and it was pumping like it, this this seven night a week thing in Melbourne we would go and I remember when I first went to London in the late eighties the same thing there would be a one there'd be a night at a particular like a, you know Sunday night at, at the Bell in King's Cross mm-hmm. and then. You know, Monday night at GAY at the Astoria. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like there was one night that you went to a particular pub or club. Mm. But in Sydney, you went, it was seven nights a week. Just the same place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with different shows and different artists, different performers every night. And they not only had the drag shows in the front bar, they also had a lounge bar out the back, a very generously sized lounge bar that had a piano and there were cabaret uh, there were people doing cab- piano cabaret singing sing-alongs and and singing um comedy you know po- uh, comedy music with a live piano um so they'd be said so they'd be really talented piano playing singers holding court in the at the same time mm. there was yeah, it was it was an emporium of entertainment <laughs> an emporium um it was, and it was just, oh, my God, it was. And, and the thing about the Albury, this is the thing, the thing about the Albury that was so magical was that in these, they had a huge cellar. There was a huge cellar that was the size of the pub, and a large, a large section of the cellar had been set up as a really fabulous dressing room. And you just walked in the, the door to the stairs down to the, to the cellar was open. It wasn't, there was nobody on the door. That there, so you just walked, you went into the, the cocktail bar and you just went downstairs and you just said hello. And so and because they already knew, I was so, we were so lucky that we, we were already quite famous because we'd had a couple of hit records and we were on Countdown and all this sort of stuff. Mm. So with the drag queens, the drag performers all knew who we were already. So it was very easy for me to just flounce down those stairs and and present myself <laughs> in the dressing room. I used to spend more time in the dressing room than I did in the in the pub. You know what I mean? Like I would go up just in time because they'd be I'd be down there hanging out with them, 
uh, while they got ready, and then I would just duck upstairs and get a good position at the bar and watch the show, and then go straight back downstairs with them. And then it wasn't that long before I stuck because I'd invented Bob by 1984. I'd invented the Bob Down character. I started performing as Bob with with the showbags in their drag shows. I started lip syncing old boy records. As ah. Bob, and so at this time, yeah. was the Globo? Did the Globo still exist at this time, or had that ended? Yeah, the Globos, the Globos, no, the Globos went on, were on and off. So the Globos, the first period of the Globos was 1980 to 1983. Then we broke up at the end of 1983. Then I invented, um, then I invented Bob the following year in 1984. Then the Globos got back together in 1986 for about a year. And and so I was doing Bob as well as the Globos. So I was singing and performing live and lip syncing in the Globos. Ah, it was okay. kind of a bit schizo, really. And so, yeah. when, so the, and, that first time that, that the Globos broke up, what was that like? Oh, it was terrible. Because we, we had a we, – everything went really – you know, everything was fabulous until it wasn't. And, and mm. we, had a, uh, we, we had a flop show. We decided that people, people did, would cut all – weird and snobby about the fact that we were lip syncing and we took that on. Mm. We sort of thought, yeah, we're, we're not really legit if we're going to keep lip syncing. So, so we decided that we'd sing and, and talk alive. And we did this show that was completely not like the shows that we'd done before. It was like a, it was as if we were doing a live tonight show with sketches and, and interviews and all this sort of stuff in it. And it just wasn't the high impact high energy thing that we'd done with the lip syncing because mm. that's the great thing about lip syncing is that phenomenal level of high energy that you can put into it because the, the because the sound is taken care of yeah you're not yeah. actually singing so you can put all that insane energy with props and costumes and all that sort of shit that that we do you know that, that you do when you're doing drag mm, mm. and so and so we had this terrible flop show that dragged on and on for months we they wouldn't close it they just kept us going we were playing it to tiny audiences at kinsella's and we were doing it like six shows or six shows a week or so it was just a complete balls up like like it was just a it was tragic and of course the, the group just didn't survive that the stress of that so the group broke up but that was okay because it was like you know we'd already been doing it for three years, and when you when you're that age, three years is an eternity. Oh yeah, yeah. But I mean, where do you go from there? Like, if that's been your whole life, for well, three that was years. the thing. Yeah. Oh, that was the thing. I, I I signed on. I I had a year off. I was absolutely. I had a bit of a breakdown. I I because I, I broke up with with Ludo and the group broke up and very acrimoniously because they I I wanted out and they didn't. Other people didn't. It was all, it was horrible. And, and so I signed on and basically stayed, with, lived in a friend's house, a very kind friend who let me re rent a room at a really cheap rate for about a year. So I, I sort of, I, I sort of just did nothing for mm -hmm. a year. I took, I, see, I never got my gap year as a young person. I should have had a gap year when I finished high school. So I was always, I was always thrown in the deep end and, and looking back realized that I was, you know, always too young for whatever was happening, mm -hmm. and so that so the so they, the the Globos happened that started while I was a young journal, trainee cadet journalist at the Sun. I was there for five years, so we started the Globos, and the Globos took off in a ridiculously easy way that sort of made you think, oh, show business is easy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. we had such a success so quickly that we thought that's the way it was, mm. <laughs> and and so when it broke up, I I. I just had a breakdown. I, I, by the time I was 24, I hadn't, I hadn't stopped. I'd never stopped. And so I did stop for a year. And then during that year, I started working at a friend's cafe. Um, a, um, uh -huh. a, a really close family friend had a cafe. And I started being a barista. Like I started slinging coffees and I absolutely loved it. And I met a girl at that cafe who was extremely funny. She was cooking in the kitchen. And between the two of us, we invented um, Bob Down. Ah, okay. So and that's that, how it happened. So that was happening, like what you know, whilst you were working, it was something to kind of keep you. Uh, mm. Well, it wasn't. Yeah, well, it wasn't. Yeah, exactly. We were fooling around, being funny at the cafe, and then there was a food fair that they, everybody used to put on little sketches and things, 
at, at a, there was a Glebe food fair on this main, this big Eat Street in in an inner western suburb of Sydney called Glebe, had a whole lot of restaurants and cafes, and they used to have a food fair every year. Mm-hmm. And we and people would put entertainment on out front of their cafe. So Kathy and I put on a sketch. We did we did a sketch, and that was the sketch in which I invented Bob as a, as a TV interviewer, uh-huh. like a Russell Harty kind of TV interviewer. Yeah. <laughs> sort of bitchy, nasty queen, you know, sort of being really nasty to the to the person that I met. And she played, but with a, a, smile. played a ditzy kind of film star. Oh, yeah, always with a smile, <laughs> killing with a smile. <laughs> yeah, and so, and then we got seen, at that sketch, we got seen by a guy that was the, the ABC here, which is our BBC, the radio, they had a comedy, they had a radio comedy unit. They, so they had actually a comedy unit, like, and he saw he was in the crowd and saw us and booked us. We started making radio sketches. Oh wow! So I was back in the business before I knew it. Wow! It so, just I happened. Mean, yeah, I mean the second uh, strike of lightning. Um, yeah, it was <laughs> super it simple. Absolutely was. <laughs> wow! It absolutely that's exactly was. And then then Kathy and I put together a, a, a two hand cabaret show, which we loved and we did. It was really fun, and Bob was in that. And I was playing piano and singing, and the Bob, the reaction to Bob was always huge. What we we're doing a whole bunch of characters, but the reaction to Bob was always huge. That the audiences showed me which way to go with Bob, and so by the so you know it wasn't long uh, before I before I went solo with the character. I went solo with the character at the beginning of 1987, while we were st- finishing up a run of shows with the Clovos. Ah, because so it's happening at the same time. Oh God, that is exhausting. Um, yeah, and, it was uh, exhausting. <laughs> and you performed Bob at the Albury. At the Albury with the showbags. Yeah, there's photographs. I, I, there is. Um, I'm not sure. There is footage, but I'm not sure whether anybody's uploaded it. But yeah, I was a boy with the three girls, with the three drag queens, and then Cindy and I started doing duets together, lip syncing duets together, really early on. So we really were very close pals by the time, by about 1980, I suppose, 80, 85, 86, 87. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we, so, and then, then there was a Wednesday nights at the Albury were, was retro night. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the nights that the showbags performed. And so the DJ, there was this beautiful man called Bill Morley, who was a wonderful, wonderful DJ that played old records and bill wasn't well at that time because you know a lot of people were getting sick at that mid 80s time Mm. mid late 80s and bill often wasn't well enough to work and so whenever bill wasn't well enough to work uh, i uh, they asked i think they asked me or maybe i put my hand up i can't even maybe it was cindy pastel who suggested it but um i i had a huge record collection from being a pop columnist on, on the sun that's what i did for the last couple of years of at the sun i was the daily popcorn so i had this fantastic record collection mm. and so i started i started djing i started djing on wednesday nights and then i would record about 20 when i got into work before the bar was empty i record 20 minutes of really up fun you know easy beats and elvis and all that sort of beatles you know mm. and i put that cassette on i put that cassette on and race downstairs and make up as bob and then come upstairs and you know hide behind the, the booth and turn on the show thing and then go go on and do the show with the show bag. <laughs> <laughs> it was very Muppets. It was very like them. It was very Muppet. Muppets take Manhattan. The whole thing just is very Muppet, shambolic. Very you mean? It's shambolic, but also just like everybody doing everything. Do you know what I mean? Like oh yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, making our own, co- you know, everybody making their own costumes. Uh, anyway, it was it was a it was a magical time. To, and so so I ended up. It wasn't that long. It was probably two or three years before I was actually you know working at the Aubrey because mm-hmm. I was also still de- I was I'm still um, well I think I'm, I was still working at the cafe I guess when I was DJing at the Aubrey and then I got and then I decided that I'd better you know get a proper job and so I went back into journalism for a while and I got a job at, as a feature writer at Vogue at Australian Vogue ah, okay. so I was there so while I was doing all this I was also working at Vogue as a journalist but you can do a lot when you're young can't you <laughs> I mean I'm just exhausted even describing it all 
<laughs> and so, you know, I want to hear more about this, um, the, the performances and the lip syncs that you were doing. So you were doing lots yeah. of duets with Cindy. What kind of songs yeah, were you like doing? Yeah, like we were doing, we were doing, uh, we still do it to this day. We still do it. We were doing uh, Louis Prima and Keely Smith's version of um, Old Black Magic. So very retro. Uh-huh. The show bags were all retro. They were all, it was all dusty and Scylla and uh, Shirley Bassey. It yeah. was all 60s and, and yeah, 60s, grassy. 50s and 60s. And I would do, um, I would lip sync uh, Jackie Wilson, Reap the Teeth. Ah, uh-huh, okay. You know, look at that, look at that, yeah, look yeah. at that, look at that. And what was really wonderful about be- be- g- developing the act as Bob is that I, in, uh, I ended up singing as Bob all the songs that I used to lip sync in the Globos and at the Albury with the show bags, mm, mm. like uh, Tower of Strength by Gene McDaniels. You know, if I were, uh, 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 you know, that dude, mm. that the point of no return, he was like a crooner, a black crooner pop star in the early 60s. Mm. And Cliff Richard, you know, on the beach. Yeah. And um, oh. I'm trying to think what what other sort of numbers. Uh, we would do, Cindy and I would do, um, you know, uh, um, Cinderella Rockefeller, <laughs> that one. Yeah. yeah. You know, you're the lady, you're the lady, you're the lady. And so we, yeah, so we'd get, we got very camp and stupid. There was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of spliffs being smoked in the dressing room. <laughs> my point out, Cindy Pastel gave me my very first joint. Oh, oh, I don't think I get anybody in trouble legally by saying that. <laughs> and can you believe that people were down in that dressing? Can you believe that people were in the cellar of that pub? Bliffing away, it's like the Royal Box. The Vauxhall Tavern is the only place in the world where you can still have a joint in the in the uh, dressing room, and I believe that's even that's gone. So you know, oh yeah, I don't think it was another cool. era. <laughs> I know, isn't it? Wonderful to think about it. <laughs> My God, oh, it I was an know, incredible like, time. I mean, how much did your wig smell of cigarette smoke at that time? <laughs> Oh, people used to, the, the pub was, bl- the, it was blue. The air was blue with cigarettes. <laughs> and of course, when you're performing, particularly at Kinsella's, they think, people used to think, because the, the audience were right up next to the stage on these long trestle tables, mm. and they were like, they, their elbows were on the edge of the stage. And people thought it was sexy while you were performing to blow smoke in your face. Like, they <laughs> thought it was kind of like cruisy to do it to you. Oh. And so I used to, if I was in the middle of a song and anybody blew cigarette at me, or smoke at me, I used to just, go, you know, I'd sing, I'd go, uh, you know, I know I sounded... <laughs> <laughs> you think, I used to just deliberately cough. cough. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you'd go home, you'd have to wash your clothes after a night out on the tiles. After a night at the Albury, followed by the midnight shift nightclub, you, you'd had to wash your clothes. Yeah. You would just be reeking of <laughs> tobacco smoke. It's the one thing that I, I definitely don't miss about that era. It mm. was disgusting. Mm. And you yeah. just took it for granted. You like yeah. no one complained about it because no, no. there was nothing anybody could do. No. Everybody smoked. <laughs> um, so can you tell me more about the show bags? Oh, yeah. Um, well, they were three insanely talented. They were very talented queens. There was Cindy Pastel. There was Glenn Lewis, who's Miss 3D, who is still performing to this very day. And, and Miss 3D had been a big success in New York and was a very good friend of uh, an amazing drag queen, a famous uh, Sydney drag queen called Doris Fish, who also became very famous and lived in San Francisco. Uh-huh. And she used to travel between Sydney and and San Francisco. And Miss 3D was very close friends with Doris. Doris died in 1991 or 1992. Mm-hmm. And she was just, just, just Google Doris Fish and you'll see. She was the one, I think Doris might have been the very first queen to um, sculpt foam rubber and create hips. Ah, okay. To actually create a female uh, line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so she, Doris was, a, and also doing that, and used to paint her teeth with whiteout, you know, with uh, liquid paper. <laughs> I know. And so, it, and then, of course, because it was the day glow era, like all the queens, Miss 3D specialised in it as well. They used to do very day glow makeup. Mm. And, um, and so then, of course, they'd, be, they'd use um, UV light. And it was just the effect with these white, 
<laughs> liquid paper paint oh, teeth was shit. just incredible. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. A lot of other people, nobody else did it because it was so destructive to, the, to your teeth. It was so bad for your teeth. Yeah. Just, how the fuck do you get it off? You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, so, so Glenn did, so Miss 3D did this very space, 60s, uh, 60s space age. That was kind of her look and still is. Mm. She does a very retro space age. So she'll make a costume that's made for, uh, you know, using 150 uh, day glow orange and day glow green plastic balls. Mm. You know, that kind of, that sort of. And then Cindy was just very, Cindy's look is very uh, dusty, sort of um, share, kind of very, very high style. 60s and 70s, mm. and then and then their third show bag was Pat Gently, who back then was called Twisty, but uh, had then changed their name to Pat Gently, which is very camp. And she did very accurate, uh, very super accurate drag uh, lip sync. Mm-hmm. Uh, things like um, things like, like uh, Brenda Lee, and that, that sort of like like like. Uh, high drama kind of records mm-hmm. yeah and so the three of them had a very individual look but then they then they, the production show they would have costumes that matched or they were made of the same fabric or so they did a very kind of you know trio you know sort yeah. of yeah a real trio thing mm-hmm. as well as these really wild spot spot numbers <laughs> yeah so it was all very extremely retro uh-huh. yeah very retro 50s 60s and 70s and so yeah. you fit right in yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And um, yeah, and that's you- right. Because Bob, Bob was like, like a seventies thing, seventies revival, as opposed to the Globos, which was sixties and fifties. Yeah. yeah. And you said um, before you referred to Bob as boy drag. Um, mm, that's right. Like Bob's like like an early drag king. Uh huh. Like a cis a cis drag king, <laughs> a cis gender drag king. Yeah. So, because, I, because I love drag, so, well, because I love drag so much, Bob is my drag queen. <laughs> I just perform a non, I, I perform a song. That's my. I suppose that's my point of difference. I perform a song as a boy, but I'm really doing drag. Yeah, but did you find mm. that people didn't couldn't quite get their head around that at the time? No, they hated me. At the, the audiences hated me at, at the audience. <laughs> oh, they absolutely hated me. Oh, they, I, they just like cricket. They just would. Just ignore me, oh. ignore me. Because back then, back then, if you if you you didn't, unless you were um, okay, back then you were either you you either had to be in drag, or you had to be a, a stripper, like a go go boy with yeah. a, like the and all the all the barmen at the Aubrey were all beautiful Sydney boys with fabulous. It was early, you know, gym gym obsession days. Yeah. So they were, had the uh, they had the first beautiful gym bodies, and they would work with their shirts off. Mm. So I'd come out on stage as this <laughs> freaky kind of dude, and they, oh no, they hated me. They hated me, but we didn't care because we just were so we were so wrapped up in doing the shows and loving hanging out with each other and performing together, particularly me and Cindy. We didn't give a fuck. I just didn't care. So it was really good grounding. It was a really good um, sort of, now that I look back on it, it was like a really good, uh, tr- it was a really good toughening up process. Yeah. And, and because, and it really stood me in good stead because within a couple of years, a year or 18 months of doing the Aubrey shows, I was performing at a really tough Melbourne cabaret room called The Last Laugh that had dinner shows, comedy shows every night with dinner, and they were like jonglers. They were like jonglers. Mm -hmm. They were like really tough, straight, uh, or, you know, suburban office workers and and girls on their hens nights, like tough audiences Mm -hmm. that gave you absolutely no quarter. And so it was great because I was ready for them by the time I got I got onto the stage at the last laugh in 1987 and 88. <laughs> so yeah, so so the Aubrey was really key to um, to you know sort of toughening me up in in front of audiences. Mm. Even though I was just lip syncing, that's what made it so easy. I didn't care because of your lip syncing. Oh yeah, yeah. The record carries you through. It's like getting on a train. You know, you don't <laughs> you don't get off until the next station. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was such a fabulous time. 
it was a really magical time. But of course, overlaying everything that was happening was the absolute horror and fear and disaster of the AIDS epidemic, where we were all terrified, mm. terrified. Mm. Yeah. And how did that change uh, going out for you? Well, it, 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 people went, it's not, my memory is that people went until, my memory is that people went out more because they were seeking, um, they were seeking distraction. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they wanted to, just to do anything to take their minds off. So it, it, all through the 80s and 90s, and also Mardi Gras had exploded, and the, the big dance parties had exploded, and also ecstasy had arrived in, what, 85, 86, 87. And again, that was people were really partying hard, I think, because they wanted to escape this daily horror show that was happening with all of our friends dropping mm, mm. one by one by one by one by one. It was so scary. And, and what did it mean in terms of, like, intimacy? Because obviously when you go to nightclubs, that is kind of one of the benefits of being there is that you get to meet people and snog them and and maybe go back to theirs. Did that all change? Yeah. Oh, well, everybody, everybody was still... No, 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 everybody was still madly snogging and madly picking up it's just that very early on we were very lucky in australia we had very progressive state and federal governments that that we had it just happened that we had labor uh, state and labor federal governments with very progressive um uh, health departments that really pushed safe sex and condom use really early on mm-hmm. thousands we, we had very few deaths compared to london or paris or San Francisco or New York in, in Australia. Mm-hmm. So we were very so so our our, our public and they they didn't close the sex clubs or they did and they didn't close the saunas. So they used the saunas and the sex on premises venues as a places to educate with mm-hmm. posters and condoms and uh, information and testing. You know, so so it it, uh, it didn't stop. Anything, everybody, and, and very. It wasn't long before people realised how you could avoid us. You could still, you know, have a great snog and a great time, and have great sex, and 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 still be safe. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, so in that sense, in that sense, uh, no, it didn't. It di- it didn't um, get it didn't get scary to the extent that nightlife stopped. In fact, as I say, my memory is that nightlife got wilder. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. in Sydney. Particularly yeah. in Sydney, that's really. I know it's a very different story in other cities. Yeah, um, and so, uh, what was Oxford Street like at that time? So, um, well, it was, it was magical. It was like there were, so there were there were at least a dozen bars and nightclubs, at least a dozen, maybe mm. more, and it was all in the space of a, it was the Golden Mile. It, it all it starts down at the. Oxford Street starts at the end of Hyde Park where the War Memorial is and it goes the the main strip it's basically about a, a about a kilometer long mm-hmm. uh, or a, about a mile up to Paddington Town Hall um, which and and with bars but not only bars and clubs there were and there still are but you know um, uh, clothing gay clothing shops gay restaurants gay cafes gay bookshops you know, a really vibrant and really concentrated gay uh, neighbourhood like the Castro in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. That's, what, that's what it was like. It was that level of, uh, and, and a lot of fun on the streets. You know, you'd see people you knew every day or, or you know, what, no matter what time of day you were at, at Oxford Street, you would see lots of people that you knew. It was a real vibrant and, and uh very, very active community. And when the AIDS epidemic hit, it became even more so because people organised, because we had to, because no one else was going to help us. You mm. know? And you said, um, so you said that you kind of stopped going to the Albury in the late 80s. Is well, that- it wasn't that I stopped going. It's just that, it's just that um, well, I guess I did stop going because I wasn't, I, 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 by, the, by the end of the 80s, by the late 80s, I was working, at the last laugh in Melbourne, so that was one of the times I moved back and was living in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. And then it wasn't long after that I did my first Edinburgh in 1988. And within about a year of doing that first Edinburgh, I was basically living in London. Ah, okay. 
So, so it wasn't that I, it wasn't, yeah, I, I just wasn't around. I wasn't in Sydney. So that's why I stopped going to the Albury. But also, um, Cindy and Pat and 3D, they, they I, I don't think they worked at the Albury much beyond the end of the 80s either. They, they were doing other nightclubs and bars and stuff. So I would just catch up with them wherever they were, wherever mm-hmm. they were working. Mm-hmm. And and then the Albury at the end of the eighties and early nineties, particularly and particularly after um, Priscilla came out, it became uh, it became a, a lot of um, shop girls and and a lot of straight people came to gawk at the drag queens because of Priscilla the movie. Yeah, yeah. And so it it became not much fun to go. It wasn't the way it was. It wasn't a fully gay pub or club anymore. So it was a bit boring. Uh, so that so when when you were in town you sort of wouldn't bother. Do you know what I mean? There were other because it was just full of tourists. Straight, yeah, that's right. Tourists, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Oh, okay. And the same thing was happening over at the Imperial too, which was great for the venues, but boring for us. Yeah, yeah, it's really fascinating, isn't it? And you can imagine the amazement when it was such a hit and the won the Oscars and you know it was just crazy what happened with that film, yeah. and it did really change people's attitude to drag in australia i mean drag is now totally you know drag became mainstream in australia pretty well before before way before rupaul or any of that yes yeah 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 because yeah because mm. of that film um yeah uh and so do you remember hearing that the old brie was closing yes yeah i do and uh and it was it was a, yes it was quite a shock and and people were very very upset but as I say, because it had become such a sort of touristy type, type of spot, uh, a lot of people that were part of the earlier era weren't, we'd, we'd sort of given up on it anyway. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Because, you know, gay clubs and bars, it's very rare to have a Vauxhall Tavern, isn't it? It's very rare for any gay bar or any gay club to get more than 10 or 15 years. Mm. You know, like, like there's, there's not that many that last go longer. Yeah. So the Albury had, you know, the Albury had a, a really, really good fifteen years. Mm. Um, did you get a chance to go and say goodbye? I don't think I did because I think when it closed, I think I was in London. Ah, because I was, I was basically based in. I know it was, it was, yeah. Well, see, when I and, and the last few times I'd been, it was so disappointing. I did, I couldn't wait to get out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And there wasn't any shows that I was particularly interested in seeing. At, at, you know, the shows that they were doing, I'd I'd lost interest in the kind of shows. I wasn't interested in the sort of shows that were doing. They were very popular. Like the place was jammed, but it just didn't have the vibe that that you know that I that that, that I loved with the show bags. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. I think it was just because of. It was really, it was really my friendship with Cindy and the showbags that the reason why I was there and working there and DJing on Wednesday nights, because Bill got sicker and sicker, and I ended up doing that sort of a lot as Bill as Bill's uh, health failed, mm-hmm. and I and I loved loved doing it, hmm. loved DJing, yeah. So you know you, you have a very intense time with the people that you're working with, and then when they don't work there anymore, you kind of lose interest in it. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Mm. So I didn't get. I don't remember the last. Is, so isn't that funny? I don't remember the first time I went to the Aubrey, and I don't, and I don't remember the last time. But my goodness me, I was there a lot. And then they, you know, it was it was such it was so incredible. It was so incredible. Did you ever go to the Aubrey Hotel? Well, if you did, I would love to hear from you. Tell me your stories and share any photos or anecdotes through social media. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook with the username K Anderson Music. Lost Spaces is not only a podcast, but a concept record as well. I've been writing songs about queer venues and the people who used to live their lives there, and will be releasing songs over the next year. You can hear the first single, Well Groom Boys, which is also playing underneath my talking right now, on all good streaming platforms. If you like this episode, I'd really appreciate if you subscribed, left a review on Apple Podcasts, or just told someone else who you think might be interested in listening to. I am Kay Anderson, and you've been listening to Lost Space. <laughs>